I will talk about galaxies uh, hosting uh, gamma ray bursts. And this is a typical event. This is the gamma ray burst. This is the galaxy stars on the, uh, along the line of sight. And it's a wretched point four. So it's quite typical. And what you observe is that these galaxies are typically small, similar to the large Magellanic cloud. They have a relatively high star formation rate, as you would expect. And the growth time scale, which is the cell and mass divided by the star formation rate, which will tell you more or less how long it takes to form the galaxy, is a few giga years. So it's active uh, star formation going on here. And if you assume that the star formation has been constant for its entire life, you build the stellar mass that you observe in, uh, in two giga years, so the formation will be a range of 0.8. Um, now, you have seen and uh, you're convinced that the gamma ray bursts are normally associated with supernova called collapse type 1c. Uh, so, this is uh, the, uh, the first uh, uh, supernova detected associated with a gamma ray burst, and there are no features, and, and it's a bright, um, bright event. And um, a few years ago, Fructan collaborators have investigated what kind of galaxies they would host GRBs and these, and these supernova explosions. And this was possible for uh, GRBs are relatively low redshift, below 1.2. And, and he made a comparison with host galaxies of normal uh, co-collapse supernovae. So these are typically type 2 supernovae, not type 1. And uh, he and others have studied the, where these events occur in the galaxies. Um, and he, um, they, they've shown that typically, wait, wait a second, typically um, supernova type 2 are distributed in relatively bright regions in the galaxy, but gamma ray bursts are distributed in the most uh, bright regions in galaxies. So, um, so you see here that normally supernova type 2, normal, normal supernova would occur in normal big galaxies, well, these big galaxies are kind of rare, actually, uh, while uh, GRBs occur on, uh, in, uh, inside uh, irregular, small, star-forming uh, galaxies. And this is shown here, this distribution of, community distribution of GRBs compared to the supernova type 2, so GRBs are most bright regions. So here you have to consider that these are just supernova type 2. If you do the same for supernova type 1c, then the dis where supernova type 1c are distributed, it's more similar to gamma ray bursts. So um, bottom line, I'm not a supernova person, but um, i like to show this. Uh, GRBs occur in, I mean, it's up, they are detected. I mean, the, the supernova connection is supernova 1c or B. And these are the most massive uh, stellar explosions in the universe, and they occur in very massive objects. While supernova type 2, they can, you know, they are much more common events, and they can occur also in kind of evolved galaxies. Um, so uh, you, you're asking, uh, well, why can't the galaxies are hosting gal uh, gamma ray bursts are spatial in any ways? So you can do many things. You can study metallicity, you can study stellar mass, you can study gas content, dust. Um, and for instance, if you study the um, galaxy stellar mass versus metallicity, metallicity versus galaxy stellar mass, and you compare with normal galaxies, um, you see in normal galaxies that there's a relation, which is called mass metallicity relation, that tells you that most massive galaxies are also more meta-rich. And, and this relation is observed in the local universe, but also at high redshift in the uh, recent years. I'm sorry, I'm missing the, the reference here. This is Levesque et al. 2010. Can you, is it possible to make it to shrink a little bit the, no, huh? the display? I guess not. Um, well, um, so you can do, um, you can study this also with gamma ray bursts of galaxies, and it's not particularly easy because the sample is not very large. But it's been done recently by Emily Levesque in 2010, 
and uh, uh, collaborators, they observed that there is a relation, a low redshift and a high redshift, but it's, it's shifted with respect to normal galaxies. So it looks like this relation is there, but it's, uh, it tells you that uh, galaxies with the st same stellar mass are more metal poor than normal galaxies. So why is that? Um, another thing that we know is that uh, host galaxies are normally star-forming galaxies. This is uh, the, this relation here, the stellar mass versus st star formation rate, which tells you uh, well, how long it takes for a galaxy to build the stellar mass uh, as a function of redshift. And the, these, the colored uh, points are GRB host galaxies. The, star form, the stellar mass star formation rate is um, proportional to the size, the stellar mass is proportional to the size of the symbol. And it tells you that, uh, this is the age of the universe, it tells you that most of these galaxies are active, they're young objects. And this is the crosses are, and the points are comparison, is comparison with normal galaxies. Um, if you want to know what short JRBs are, these are the red circles here. So they're distributed, but you know, it's hard to tell because the sample is very, it's very small. So uh, what, uh, what do we know from this sample? If you took, I mean, what we know is mainly a low redshift sample, which is low, lower than 1.5. So JRB holes are generally small, are metal poor, uh, not much dust apparently, and, and they start forming. And so we want to know, is this typical for the entire universe, for the population of galaxies, and is it actually changing with redshift? So what happens at higher redshift? The problem is that it's difficult to detect these galaxies because normally they're very faint, um, but we, have, uh, we start to have some ideas. And when you want to learn this, you have to consider that the universe had some major changes in the, from redshift two to now, to redshift zero. And the changes are about star formation rate, stellar mass, galaxy merger rate, and also galaxy size. So we are talking about the general population here, and these are the changes that happen uh, in the universe in the last eight uh, giga years or so. Um, yes? That's the extinction is not very high. Yeah, they're, it's, as an infrared source, they're, they're not powerful, but they're plenty of extinct. I mean, plenty of red um, Yes, <coughs> I agree with you. But if you talk about people looking at gamma reverse host galaxies, they will tell you that they're dust poor. That's the common uh, belief. But I agree that there's a lot with, I know we show us something about this, and I will discuss this. So about the size of high redshift, they can be very small. Um, so that's why there is one reason why it's hard to study them. If you take Andromeda and you shift Andromeda to redshift about two or so, it will be much larger than a GRB host galaxy. But the universe um, itself is changing from redshift two to, I mean, from, this is a, you know, this plot will show you how much the half-light radius is changing in galaxies from redshift 8 to 2. So these are normal galaxies. Uh, the, these are the bright ones, these are the faint ones, and the, the change in the size is dramatic from redshift 8 to 2. Um, and it's changing also uh, uh, up to, re to, log to the local universe. So the fact that they are small galaxies is not surprising. Mm -hmm. is smaller uh, compared with solar metallicity. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so the sense of the question is whether that the smaller metallicity is something peculiar and particular to GRB both galaxies, or is that typical of the redshift interval at which GRBs are seen? 
Uh, the answer to this is it's a total mess, and I'll show you. It's a total mess. We cannot. Well, people say they are meta poor, but not always. And actually, some GLBs have high metallicity at high redshift. So this I will show you in a moment. So I'll, I'll be able to confuse your ideas a lot. I'm already being confused. Ah, okay. So, um, yeah, I think there is a lot to learn. Yes, that one is covered really. So I'll show you a few. Um, uh, facts about the evolution of the universe in general for galaxies, for normal galaxies, not for JB host galaxies. So what we know is that the star formation rate density of the universe is evolving and also the m major merger rate. And the, the change is dramatic from redshift 1.8 to 0, it's a factor of 50 in star formation rate density in the universe. So with in the past there were uh, 50 times more star formation rate than in the local universe. And the, mer the merger rate, major merger rate between big galaxies has also changed by a large factor from back then to now. So we would imagine that this would have an effect on the nature of GRB host galaxies because GRB is a phenomenon associated with massive uh, expl uh, stellar explosion and also massive star formation. Okay. Um, so and you're, assu you're, you're assuming the star formation rate is dominated by the massive stars? Uh, well, this um, it's an indication that there's a lot of star formation if you have massive, massive stellar so explosion. Uh, say that again. If you're assuming the mass distribution of the stars, right? Uh -huh. so you, when you form stars, you get a mass distribution, uh -huh. some kind of power. Uh -huh. or something. Um, yeah, I don't assume anything. These are just galaxies. You observe the star formation rate in galaxies, and you measure the star formation density in a volume, and you see how this changes with. Uh, with time. I don't see anything about the local, where this star formation is actually happening and if galaxies are, have a different IMF, initial mass function or, or something. This, uh, I don't do this. Uh, what I can tell you is that the, this is the same plot in different uh, uh, paper. Where you see here is the star formation rate density done for different stellar masses. So these are the massive galaxies, these are less massive galaxies. And what you see here is a drop of uh, contribution from massive galaxies in the star formation rate density. So big galaxies were contributing, uh, but after redshift two or so, they were not contributing that much in the star formation rate density, in the history of star formation rate density. So if this is true, uh, you might imagine that a, a low redshift star formation rate happened generally in small galaxies. And you would conclude that you would expect gamma reverse to, to occur in small galaxies. So this, all this looks kind of normal in the end. So you would expect at redshift below one and a half, the GRBs happened in small galaxies because contribution from big galaxies is relatively small. About the, the metallicity, the mass metallicity relation here in the local universe, it looks like this, there is a large dispersion. Um, but recently, um, Manucci et al. and, other, and others also has, uh, have uh, demonstrated that, the, that this mass metallicity relation is also a function of the, speci of the star formation rate. That means that if you have a metal poor galaxy here, no, sorry, if you have a galaxy with large star formation rate here, uh, you would expect to be more metal poor for the same stellar mass. Is that clear? No. no. Okay, so uh, one step it's for a strong slide. Everything is backwards. So that is exactly <laughs> that's you know, totally counterintuitive. Please say it again. Okay. So that I really want to make sure that I, I didn't mishear you. Okay. So this is the the that's mass materials. Mass materials. Right. Yeah. Now you add another parameter and you put star formation rate in right. the galaxies, yes. and this is what you get. So for higher stellar star formation rate 
your metallicity is lower. That's, yeah, doesn't make sense. That makes very little sense, really. Why not? You, Why? Physically, I mean, if you have a star, higher star formation rate, yes. right, assuming that the IMF, the initial mass function, is not metallicity dependent, right assuming that, mm -hmm. um, then you would expect that higher star formation means that you would have a fraction of the star, higher rate of uh, metal product. Star form, which yes. will then explode and enrich the galaxy with more metals. Yeah. But it also tells you that the galaxy is young, has a lot of gas, and maybe didn't have the time to pollute the gas with metals. It's still high. I mean, that is reflected in your x-axis, no? X-axis is showing what the mass is. But this is the, st it's the stellar mass. I know that. It doesn't tell you how much gas that's there true. is. That's true. But it would be interesting to see if there is also another parameter, which is the gas fraction. If your gas fraction is lower when the star formation rate is high, then you imagine this galaxy to be metal poor. It's in the process of forming and to enrich the gas with metals. There's another effect that I could kind of understand that it will push things in the direction that you are projecting or mm -hmm. the observations are. And that is that the smaller a galaxy is, the smaller is the gravitational potential. Yes. And when a star explodes, then Yes. The metals, meaning the remnant, is not bound to the galaxy and escapes. Yeah. And that is something that I can kind of understand. Yeah, this is what uh, Manuchetal actually are concluding that the wind, Manuchetal, the, the people actually found this, fun, it's mean, called fundamental. Huh? Yeah, they assume that there is strong wind in the galaxy and they would, they will, uh, the metals will be ejected in the, in, the, in, the stellar me, in, the, in the galactic medium. This is what they conclude. But they don't say anything about what's the total mass of the galaxy. It might be that these, you know, those galaxies with high star formation rate, they have a lot of gas where metallicity is low because there's a lot, it's young, it's still star forming. So um, it's debated at the moment, something new, 2010. Can we also interpret it as uh, merging or reducing higher mass of galaxy is accompanied by uh, nuclear synthesis? Merging. Yeah. The merger of galaxies. And formation of much more bigger galaxies is accompanied by nuclear synthesis. Is it true? Uh, I don't know. I think we're still debating. <laughs> we're still debating whether mergers is actually common in gamma ray burst source galaxies. Well, yeah, star formation, yes. Yeah, it's um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Merging, yeah. But I mean, it's actually, the merging is actually uh, boosting the star formation yeah. rate or quenching star formation rate because this is also not clear. Um, so uh, the other thing is that the, the stuff, the mass metallicity relation is evolving with redshift in s this way, okay? So you have to consider the relation, but also that it's evolving with redshift. Um, okay, and another thing that we need to consider is the, uh, the cosmic stellar mass assembly. Uh, so he, this plot shows how many stars there are in the universe as a function of time. And in the recent time, let's say in the recent eight giga years, the stellar mass of the universe doubled, more or less, which is not a large increase in terms of stellar mass. Um, so that tells you basically that uh, the, there's a major change uh, in, uh, for, redshift, uh, uh, for redshift higher than 1.2, but after redshift 1.2, then you expect gamma bursts to occur where star formation rate happens, and star formation rate happens in small galaxies. But doesn't this argument speak against it, the previous uh, interpretation of, of the unknown gas mass? And if the stellar mass only doubles, the yes. gas mass cannot have such a big effect. Yes. <laughs> it's a multiple dimension universe. It's, yeah. it's much more confusing. Uh, than it looked before. Before it looked so much easier. Metallicity was low, at high redshift, now it's high. And, but now uh, it's, it's not you, clear. Yes? Me, if I just a second, go back to the previous slide. Um, this yes, one? and the one the next to it, which is to say, no, no, not next to it, meaning then you had put this effect of uh, star formation rate. Great. Um, so now, in the view of this particular information, we go back to the claim that metallicity for GRB-Bosch galaxies 
is lower. But they are also smaller galaxies, meaning maybe one tenth of the early star galaxy, right? So now combining this graph and asking the question, is the metallicity of GRT post galaxies really is smaller compared to what you expect for 10% LS star galaxies? What's the answer? Yes, exactly. Hmm? Maybe not. Maybe it's normal. No, but I'm asking you. I mean, that's a normal yeah. thing, right? Well, I mean, now... Yes, um, I agree. I mean, to me, uh, JB host galaxies, there is no evidence that they are spatial galaxies. They look spatial because they are actually detected with gamma ray uh, detectors. They don't select galaxies according to brightness or how much star formation rate there is or if you have strong metal lines. They're just detected because there is a gamma ray explosion there. And in principle, it's a a random selection of galaxies. Just you have a very rare event that is uh, the explosion of a very massive star. I mean, that is the question, right? But then it is a random selection. I don't want to dwell on it for too long because I know you have <coughs> many other things to cover. But I just want to clarify this particular point whether GRD or galaxies are special, but only in the sense of metallicity. Because there are a number of claims, a number of papers claiming that the metallicity is small. And I'll the show you. Is whether it is small compared to the size of the galaxy. No, I think uh, a, a, a low redshift you expect this to be low generally, but high redshift things can be different. And there is a large spread of metallicity in the host, and it's very hard to convince people otherwise because they've been talking about metal poor, metal poor because the progenitor has to be metal poor because you need to have a zero metallicity uh, star. Otherwise, you lose winds and you lose angular momentum. That's the main problem. Uh, but it, it is not fully demonstrated that this is the case. The super, I mean, it's associ they're associated with supernova type 1c, which they lost a big envelope, a big you know, fraction of the mass. So anyway, um, maybe um, I should skip something. I just uh, wanted to show this that Anatoly showed yesterday. Uh, these are spectroscopically confirmed objects. So the, the record for quasars and galaxies and GRBs, and GRBs are way above galaxies and, and, and um, quasars. And the advantage of using uh, GRBs as a, you know, to, to detect high redshift objects is that they disappear. And when they disappear, you know it's an, it's an ex explosive event, like in, in this case. The redshift is not particularly uh, well determined, but you know it's a high redshift. And when you have a galaxy, like this one, I don't know if you remember this, uh, was published a few years ago. It's not this paper here, I think it was one or two years before, that they claim that this galaxy was a high redshift galaxy, it reaches 6.2. At that point, it was a record for galaxies. And when you have photometry and photo Z for galaxies, you, can, you cannot be sure that this is a high redshift object because you always have a competition with possible uh, you know, with that, this other minimum in the chi-square distribution for redshift, which is a redshift about two. So you can have a small galaxy, red because there is dust, or there is metals, there is a lot of metals, and you, you can still you know, reproduce this um, distribution of points in the SED. And actually this object was, up, was uh, it's, it's in the HUD, uh, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, and it was reanalyzed again by these people here, the original paper, I don't have the reference here. And with the same data, they found that actually it was very likely a galaxy at achieved 2.6. So when you have GRBs, it's easier because you know that it's a power law, you know that it's disappearing, so it's easier to get the photometric redshift. So, um, the, the problem with gamma rays is that they fade quickly, but it's also an advantage because once it's gone, it is easier to observe the galaxy itself, regardless of how bright it is. So it is, um, the, 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 the GRB is brighter than the entire galaxy for a moment, but then after a few weeks, it's gone, so you can look at the galaxy itself and learn a lot of things. And uh, a high redshift, uh, this was done using quasar, 
quasars like a background point source that would illuminate the galaxy and tell you uh, a lot of information about the interstellar medium galaxies at high redshift. With GRBs, you have the, the GRBs itself in the galaxy, and you can do similar things. You have the spectrum of the afterglow, and you have lots of information coming from the interstellar medium, which is absorbing the, spe the, the, the emission from the GRB, and you get a lot of information about the, the gas. And once it is gone, you observe the entire galaxy, you learn more about the host galaxy, the hot phase of the gas, for instance, with the emission lines, and also doing photometry, you learn something about the stellar mass, star formation rate, and the history of, of the galaxy. So there is a lot of information there. The, the trouble is that sometimes to combine everything together is, is difficult. Um, so to give you an idea, if you use a quasar as a um, background uh, source, quasars are very bright. And they shine for a long time, so they don't disappear gam like gamma ray bursts. So this, this is how we study the, the metallicity in galaxies at high redshift for a long time. And then people started to look at galaxies themselves. So imagine, you know, this is a quasar, which is 70 magnitude, and here you have galaxies also at high redshift, but are much fainter. But you can do, uh, what you do is you, you, you study the emission, not the absorption of the galaxies, and, and they're still uh, relatively faint. When you have a GRB, the GRB doesn't care how bright the galaxy is, and you can end up studying very faint objects. Okay, so, and this is kind of difficult. Uh, and because emission lines are in the optical, and they are studied in the, in the optical up to redshift one, one and a half, and absorption lines are UV lines, and they are detected in the optical for redshift larger than two, generally speaking, the two samples are kind of uh, disconnected. So here you study the GRB host um, itself, and here you study the GRB DLA, this large absorption, which means uh, damp laminar alpha absorption. And it's UV uh, lines associated with the cold interstellar medium. Um, so I showed this comparison between uh, the histogram of GRB, uh, GRB as so a function of redshift with comparison with quasars, to, just to, to show that it's much flatter uh, in, in terms of time. This is log of time, or one plus c. Um, and I like this better than the using just redshift because it stretches time uh, for, for low redshift, um, for the low redshift, redshift universe. And if you compare this with the star formation rate uh, density of the universe, it doesn't look terribly different. Uh, that means that probably we're not missing many, many objects um, at low redshift. So I'm, uh, I showed this for you because you had this plot yesterday, sub-formation rate density compared to gamma ray burst uh, histogram. And you said that the GRBs are much, many more than uh, what you would expect from sub-formation rate density studied normally with normal galaxies. But from here, it's not clear whether you're missing anything or not. Um, so um, it is a powerful way to actually uh, study the evolution of star formation rate right density in the universe. And this was done uh, in the last few years by many people. This is the star formation rate right density again, the, the same as I showed you before, but with the real points. And, and recently with gamma ray bursts, this is how it looks like, and the normalization is kind of difficult. It was done again by others, and it looks different. The normalization is done here this time. And it might be, as we said yesterday, that GRBs are, um, are basically telling you that the star formation rate at high redshift is much higher than what it is observed from normal galaxies. So it might be that we are missing a lot of ac action here. Uh, and gamma reverse will tell you something. Um, if you want to know what happens to massive galaxies, so these are submillimeter galaxies here, the subformation rate given by submillimeter galaxies, massive galaxies, a lot of dust, a lot of uh, large objects, uh, large stellar mass, and the star formation rate is 20% uh, given uh, by these galaxies. And it goes up with redshifts. So 
uh, it might be also with uh, these are ultra luminous infrared galaxies. It might be that if you go even higher redshift, uh, the contribution to the star formation red density might be um, um, more important than it, than what it is at redshift lower than two and a half. Um, about metallicity, uh, so this is uh, for you. Um, the, the, these are two different afterglow spectra, one at redshift 3.6 and one at redshift 2.1. And the, oops, I think I had some, uh, uh, maybe I lost something, but here the, the H1 column density is about 10 times lower than here. So this tells you how much gas there is in the, in the galaxy. And the metal lines here are much stronger than here. So the enrichment in metals in the host galaxy is much higher in this object than it is here. And so that tells you that the, that the fact that these objects are always metal poor is not totally right. Certainly not at high redshift. So uh, is this confusing enough? Yes. Uh, so I'll, I'll show you more points in a moment. Um, so this is the same object here, metal rich, and I compare this with a metal poor galaxy in the local universe. And so this is dwarf galaxy at redshift 0.01. And you see here, H1 is much more. Metal lines, I mean, I'm comparing with the same, uh, the same wavelength. Metal lines here are much weaker than here. And this might be a typical host galaxy for a gamma burst or low redshift, but here it, is, it looks totally different. And the other thing that you might notice that often people say uh, structure, fine structure lines in uh, JB host galaxies are indicating that there is a gamma burst there because it's an excited gas and it's coming from the UV uh, light produced during the explosion. But you, silicon, uh, for instance, silicon two star here and here is also observed in local dwarf galaxies. So the presence of fine stretcher lines in galaxies doesn't indicate the presence of gamma bursts also, the, the gamma bursts, not necessarily. Uh, so here, if you compare these galaxies, the, the, those three that I show you, here's the local dwarf galaxy, here's the low redshift uh, object, 980425, the one with the supernova, and this is the high redshift one. You see that these three objects, these three galaxies, have nothing in common one with the other. Not the stellar mass, not the star formation rate, not the metallicity. So we don't have a typical uh, host galaxy. All, the only thing that we know is that the host galaxy has to be star forming. We're talking about long gamma ray bursts. So this is the metallicity plot that um, we have been knowing for a number of years for the universe. Metallicity is a function of redshift and measured using quasars as a background light. And the quasar is a random object. It's crossing galaxies, the light, and then you can study the metallicity uh, for many, many objects. We have hundreds of, of objects right now. And they see that there is an evolution of redshift, which is very steep. 10 minutes. Um, one second, I want to see where I am in my plot. OK. Um, and if you add what we know for gamma ray source galaxies, oh no. First, I'll show you this. So this is what you would expect given the stellar, the mass metallicity relation. And it's also predicted by models producing metallicity evolution given the star formation rate density. So you would expect an evolution with metallicity which is much flatter and it also depends on the stellar mass of the galaxy. So it's steeper for objects that are smaller and it's flatter for more massive objects. So this is um, this evolution redshift that you find with quasars um, will tell you that there is um, a, a metallicity crisis. And this was known for a number of years as uh, the missing metals problem. So models will predict more metals than we, what we actually would see. Gamma bursts you have in 
a low rate shift to measure metallicity from emission lines and they are relatively low, generally speaking. If you use absorption lines, then you have the same situation with quasar. You have an object at high rate shift explosion and the absorption lines and the metallicities are spread all over. There are some that are metal rich, some that are metal poor. And this object here is the one with high metallicity. And the spread of metallicity is over two, two orders of magnitude. Um, and recently, there have been two galaxies studied with emission lines that show high metallicity. So this will make the picture more confusing also for the low redshift uh, universe. So the situation is a total mess. The, the metallicity evolution of the universe is a function of, um, of how large the galaxy is. And since there is a large spread in the universe, you can expect anything. Um, so about the, the mergers, um, would you ex expect these objects to uh, explode in, uh, in systems that are merging? Um, well, uh, we have some evidence that this can happen, not so rarely. The metal-rich objects that I showed you show very strong metal lines separated by two systems, separated by 700 kilometers per second. And it's not unique, there are others. And this is another one. And the separation here is also similar, 700 kilometers per second. And another one, this is a little larger, 2,000 kilometers per second. So the fraction of these double absorbers at high redshift associated with the GRB afterglow is relatively high. A factor of a few higher than what you would expect using absorption lines in quasars, as a quasar as a background light. Um, and what do we actually see? Here are other targets. Uh, it's also high redshift, 2.6. We have the GRB happening where the arrow is pointing, and you have two objects here. This is the afterglow spectrum here. So uh, the H1 absorption here and lots of metals. And then you can observe A and B, and you see the spectrum here with emission lines. They are at the same redshift of, of the GRB afterglow here in the middle. And the separation here is uh, could be uh, about 20 kiloparsec or so. So they are interacting systems and the separation um, is large, uh, but not terribly large. Um, these are parameters for the, the, um, the host galaxy. It's relatively, well, the, mental, the, stellar, the stellar mass is not well determined. H1 is very high. Metallicity is kind of uh, low, but this is expected for high redshift. Star formation rate is not particularly high. This is another system. Um, forget about the, this yellow line. The host is here. Uh, the, the, host, the host was observed recently. These are uh, the parameter for the host galaxy. It's a massive galaxy. Its star formation rate is very high. And the galaxy A, which is separated by, uh, I would say, about 20 kiloparsec, well, 15, 20, uh, is at the same redshift of the, of the host galaxy. So here is the spectrum, the host here, and the galaxy A here. So the separation is kind of large, uh, but again, if you compare this with the Andromeda galaxy at the same scale, uh, it can, they, these two blobs can belong to the same system. They are gravitation, can be gravitationally bound. Another example is here. Mm -hmm. Yes? Sorry, could you go back to that, shift, that spectrum? I'm sorry, I can't, I can't see the, the velocity. Is that, that, is that a fat line? Um, that a, do you mean this one here? Yes. How, how this is uh, 500. So those lines are no, wait a second, I can see. Sorry. Yeah, they're, they're large, yeah. So it's not a You mean if it's an AGN? Well, it is large, yeah. But I think uh, they are supposed to be larger at high redshift because the, 
Um, these are compact objects and massive. The mass is you know, similar to the Milky Way, but very compact. And you would expect the velocity dispersion to be larger, the rotation to be larger, otherwise gravitation will dominate and the galaxy will collapse. So uh, I believe it is expected to be a little larger than what you would typically see in the local universe. So, so there is uh, in this case, um, I don't know. AGN, uh, people have been looking for AGN contamination in these host galaxies and it was not found. Normally it's not found. But Maybe there is one case. But the oxygen 3 is, is not narrow, which is weird for AGN. So I, don't know. I understand. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Well, yes. I can have a look and see better. But yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, it looks, you know, it also gives a bad impression because this is high resolution. So you wouldn't expect to have such a big thing, a redshift uh, 2.3, but it's high resolution so it looks larger than what you normally see. And it looks in the sense that normally you cannot have resolved emission lines because normally you only see, you only use a medium resolution spectroscopy. I uh, have to continue, I'm afraid, but we can talk more about this. This is another case, also here a companion and a double absorber here and the mission here. And very, very recently, like a couple of months ago, uh, this galaxy here, a Redshift Point 28, um, had an explosion and the separation from the host galaxy is eight kiloparsecs. Uh, how many minutes? Two minutes. Um, this one, um, do you remember? It's a supernova. No, I think the supernova was detected. It's the very recent one. It's a long, I guess it's long. I don't know the duration. Yeah. But the supernova was seen. Um, so the other question is, what's the relation with a massive galaxies at high redshift that have massive star formation rate and massive content of uh, gas and dust. So this is a nice picture of a star forming region in the Milky Way, in the optical and in the infrared. I mean, you see much more when you go at high, uh, in the, with uh, high wavelength. And so going back to your question about AV, it was recently found that uh, the afterglows of GRBs can have very high extinction. If you are fast enough that you can actually detect the afterglow early on and regardless how much dust there is, you can see them. So if you can do this, there is a fraction of these GRB afterglows that have high extinction. And the trouble is when you have high extinction, then it is very complicated to do anything because the objects get very faint. So when they're faint, you don't see them. What you see is what, what is here when AV is very low, and then you conclude that there is no dust. But it's not true. Dust can be large. And these objects can be also at high redshift. The, the difference is that you have to be really fast. But there's a small fraction of large, with large extinction. There's a small, a small fraction with large extinction, yes. But we don't know whether we are missing something up here. Yeah. And if you want to see this, the stellar mass, I mean, these are, um, these are normal galaxies at high, a low redshift here, the dark points, and the red points are the high redshift, the redshift but one. And if you want to see what's the stellar mass of host galaxies for a small sample, a low redshift, below 1.6, uh, we still don't know whether, I mean, the error bars here are very large, but it looks like there is a contribution from uh, massive uh, galaxies. Um, do I have a minute? No minute. Um, then I'll show you the last slide, which is um, this one here. We had some hope that maybe some of these host galaxies would be sub, uh, submillimeter galaxies, but a uh, few, few weeks ago, this paper was published um, 
was an astral pH. And this shows you that some of these objects have high uh, submillimeter emission, which would indicate lots of dust and lots of gas and lots of star formation, but with more uh, observations at high redshift, lots of these host galaxies are showing just upper limits. There is no radio submillimeter emission in these objects. And so they would be probably more comparable to normal uh, Lamar Bay galaxies at high redshift here. So this is the, the JB host population and the comparison with submillimeter galaxies. They are kind of different. So the last one is uh, my conclusions. Uh, JLB host galaxies are important to probe galaxy formation and evolution. Uh, there is a fraction of them that are dusty, um, but detected finally if you are fast enough. And the chemical evolution is uh, a sh you know, spread over orders of magnitude. There is no chemical evolution. Uh, not detected so easily. Um, and star formation rate density can be probed using gamma bursts. Um, so we rely on SWIFT, and SWIFT is, um, has been um, um, funded for another two years until 2014. And after this, we need to have another mission ready, or maybe have more support for SWIFT. Thank you, sorry for taking so much time. Thank you.